If you have your Bible, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. Have you ever heard the phrase, money is the root of all evil? Or have you ever heard that cleanliness is next to godliness? How about God will not give you more than you can handle? Have you ever heard it said that God helps those who help themselves? These are phrases that we may have heard, but would it surprise you to learn that none of them are in the Bible? You've heard it said, but when you look to see what God's Word says, in some of them it's just a slight misunderstanding. For example, the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. So just a slight misunderstanding. When you hear something like God helps those who help themselves, that almost goes contrary to the teachings of God's Word. God's Word says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. They may be trying to teach a way of living, but sometimes the phrases we use, the teachings we've heard, the examples we're given are far from the actual words of the Bible. We're going to be looking today at the beginning of a series that I'm calling, You Have Heard It Said, But I Say Unto You. These are teachings that Jesus gives during the Sermon on the Mount, six times where he says that you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, you've heard other people talk about what the law and the prophets say, but I'm teaching you something that will fulfill that or show you the true way of understanding it. What happened in Jesus' day is that over the course of time, people would read the scriptures and then they would give a teaching on it. And your, your scribes, your elders, your, your priests would give a teaching. And as time continued to go, rather than look at what God had written, they would look at what the teachers said about God's Word. It got to a point to where you could have a whole conversation about what God intended without ever turning to the actual scriptures to see. And so traditions were formed, and new laws were set up, and new interpretations were, were brought about, sometimes with the best of intentions. The, God's Word in the Old Testament is complicated sometimes, so teachings were, were given to help you look at the do's and don'ts in order to fulfill that. But then, over the course of time, also, in an effort to try to make God's Word more, more uh, approachable or easier to accomplish, the teachers began creating laws that almost went against the teachings of the Bible. And so as Jesus is sitting here teaching the people, he's going to say things like, you've heard it said. These are not things that were Jesus quoting the Old Testament. He does sometimes quote some of the rules, but what he's addressing is not actually God's Word, but the false teaching that had cropped up around those commandments and was trying to give a correction. As I've said before, and I'll say it a couple more times probably as we continue with this series, he was fulfilling the desires of the Old Testament laws that God gave. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then let's look at the scriptures that we have. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. As we read your word together, I pray that you will open up our minds to receive the fresh understanding that what you have to say to us today can impact us immediately if we'll open up our hearts to receive your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A moment ago, I asked you to open up your Bibles to chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. If you have not gotten your Bible yet, I invite you to take just a moment um, and run get that or pick that up. It is invaluable that we look at God's Word together. The error of the people in Jesus' day was only listening to what others had said and not studying the Scriptures for themselves. So as I read this passage of Scripture, I invite you to read it along with me in your Bible. This is Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. I'm going to pause there because I want to talk about this passage. In Jesus' day and culture, they knew the Ten Commandments. They knew that one of the commandments was, you shall not murder. We have that. We still follow that. That is still a law that we ascribe to. So you may be saying, what was Jesus trying to say? What's new here? What's the conflict or what's the better thing that Jesus is trying to teach? 
In his culture, the Pharisees would say essentially something akin to what we might say. If you're talking how bad someone is or someone's trying to, to uh, criticize you, you may say to them, well, hey, I never killed anybody. And they use that as the model for something that was obviously quite terrible. And they say, I am righteous, I am holy, I have not committed any sin, I've never murdered anybody. And so this passage is looking at not only the action, but also the heart. The Pharisees had the actions under control. They were obeying by, by all the different checklists of do's and don'ts. And for their, from their perspective, it was fine if you were angry with somebody. It was fine if you held a grudge. It was fine if you talked badly about them because, hey, at least you hadn't killed them. And this is not in any way to say, before we travel too far down this road, that to be angry with someone or to insult someone is the same level uh, against them as murdering them. There's a difference. What it is saying is that to where, whether you have murdered someone or whether you have held this bitterness or spoken down to them, you are guilty under God's righteous law. There are different guilts. There's different, there would be a different punishment in our world for, for murdering someone. In the Old Testament, uh, there were different punishments. But it's saying that you don't get to hang on to some sense of righteousness just because you haven't murdered somebody. If you have these attitudes in your heart, if you're filled with hate or you're filled with anger against someone to where it leads to bitterness or you trying to bring them down as an individual, you are also guilty. You're guilty of something different, but you're still guilty. And Jesus is showing us in these next six weeks that we all have within us the ability to, to behave or at least have that emotions. And what Jesus is saying to us, or will be saying to us in the next six weeks, is that when we talk about, when we talk about anger, we have angry hearts. We have murderous hearts. When we look at lust, it says that we have lustful hearts. Even if we've never acted upon those, it is still the characteristic that we carry around with us. He was saying to the Pharisees and to his disciples sitting there with him, you don't get to claim some righteousness simply because you've not done the most terrible things. He says that if you have, I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And this isn't just that flash of anger that you have sometimes. Somebody, sometimes someone does something to us, and we have this flash of anger, this rise of, of temperature, and then we realize what's happening, and we settle back down. It's not so much that momentary flash but it's what are you going to do with that anger? Are you going to start thinking of ways to get even with that individual? Are you going to treat them poorly because they treated you poorly? Which is that, the exact opposite, again, of what Christ teaches us. If someone gets in your face and starts yelling at you and, and shoving you, are you going to get back in their face and start yelling at them and shoving them because your pride has been insulted or you're going to have to stand your ground? Jesus is saying here that the heart that you approach people needs to be the same heart that Christ has when he sees us, a heart of mercy and a heart of love. So a lot of us in our culture, anger is, is oftentimes not seen as nearly negatively as I think that Jesus is looking at it. Anger is a natural emotion, and again, I think there are times when it's going to rise up, and, and we've got to deal with that and operate in a way to where if we have a, a what we'll call a righteous anger over some sin or some, something terrible happening in our world, we've still got to look at the way we respond even in that anger. But I don't think Jesus is talking about some righteous anger here. I don't think he's talking about being angry because there is hunger in the world or angry because someone has met such a great sense of injustice. I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that selfish anger that rises up within us because we don't get our way. Have you ever experienced that? You know, today is, is Mother's Day, and, and we want to honor and celebrate our moms, but there's a phrase that our culture has. It says, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's right. You know, then that's teaching that, that you know, as, as the mother's emotions are going, that's going to affect the way the family goes. Parents, we've got to remember that the way we talk to our children and speak to our children has to be honoring to God and honoring in recognition that they are also created in His image. 
Parents, the way we speak to our children, even when they're misbehaving or disobedient or rebellious, we've got to make sure that our, our approaching them and speaking to them is coming from a place of love. Can we be stern? Can we be, can we be corrective? Absolutely. But we've also got to treat them as human beings that deserve love, respect, and mercy. How about to your spouses? Husbands, talking to your wives. Wives, talking to your husbands. When you are in a disagreement or in an argument, is the way that you're treating that individual coming from a place of anger and maybe even hate in that moment? Or is it coming from a place of love for that individual? The relationship, this kind of conversation, extends to all different areas. Your co-workers, your children, students, your classmates, your other family members, children back to your parents. You may not like everything that your parent has to say to you, but how are you treating them? Are you getting angry with them and walking and stomping around the house and slamming doors and treating your brothers or your sisters or your parents disrespectfully because of your anger? Jesus would look at you and say, just as the murderer is guilty of breaking the law, the anger in your heart is also making you guilty. Then he says, he says that you also, whoever insults his brother, will be liable to the council. We live in a culture that doesn't mind the occasional insult. When I was a youth pastor, I went on a retreat with some youth, and I tried to set up or establish that absolutely zero name-calling could occur. No name-calling of any kind whatsoever, because I was thinking of this principle. But it's almost an impossibility because part of our culture is those, those light jabs, those little razzes that we do, the, the minor insults, hey, you jerk, or things of that nature. You know, the, just the little things that we say, we almost use them in an endearing fashion. We say them not out of anger or even out of malice. We say them out of a place of affection for the individual. So I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about either. Those, those playful jabs... Now, I do think we need to be careful with those playful jabs because sometimes what we say as playful can come across to the person as hurtful. And if that occurs, we need to be quick to apologize. Jesus is talking about when we start to rake someone across the coals and call them names out of anger or bitterness, when we try to belittle them because we don't agree with them or because we don't like the, the way that they um, respond to something or because of their race, a lot of times we insult people simply because of the color of their skin. That is absolutely wrong. Whenever we make a, a, a prejudiced statement because of someone's culture or someone's uh, ethnicity or someone's socioeconomic status, we say just because, the, because they're poor, we treat them one way. Because they're rich, we treat them another way. As particularly when it comes from a place of anger or resentment, that is not honoring to God. That is not what he calls us to do. We need to be very careful with our prejudices when we speak down to people. Did I say that correctly? Our prejudices <laughs> when we speak down to people. And beyond that, however, we've got to look at it, not that, you know, that's a broad brush, but how do we talk about that between one-on-one -on -one people? Whenever you're talking to someone and they may anger you and something rises up within you and you want to just really lay into that person and just tear them down, Jesus would say, you need to check your heart. You need to watch what you're about to say. The profanity or the insult or the, the belittling that is about to come out of your mouth is a reflection of what's going on in your soul. And you need to be very careful of what you're about to say. That is someone created in the image of God, just as you are. It says, then it says not only to the insult, but then he says also, whoever says to his Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. You fool is, is even beyond insult. It's where you look at that person and you almost consider them less than a person. You almost consider them not worthy of your time or your rank or your, your position in life. You would rather that person were dead than be near you. Have you ever looked at someone with that level of loathing? Have you ever been in the presence of someone where j that you would rather they would just die? They just would be better off the world if they were dead. That's a murderous spirit that you have in your soul. 
Jesus says that you, if you're going to place someone to where you would rake someone across a call like that and call them a fool and are a moron and mean it, not some friendly jab, some actual interpretation, then you are the one that has it, is at fault. Whenever I think about insulting and, and meanness, I always have this, this memory of high school. I don't know if I'd shared you with this before, but one day after gym class, all the boys were in the boys' locker room and changing, and there was this guy who the jocks always liked to pick on. And, and they would shove him, and they would call him big nose, and they, would, they were just mean to him. And I remember one occasion this was going on, and, and I, 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 I did not to my own discredit, and I think about it so much of what I would like to do, we always have those opportunities where we would want to say, if I could go back in time and change this, this is one case where I would love to go back and step in and defend somebody. But they were picking on him, and they were making fun of him, and they were shoving in him, and finally several of the guys picked him up and literally shoved him in the trash can. They took another human being and picked him up and shoved him in the trash can. Now, you may say to yourself, well, I've never picked anybody up and shoved them in a trash can. But their sin, those young boys' sin began not when they picked him off the floor, but where they got it within their heart that it was okay to make fun of him because he didn't have the same quality of clothing as they had. His facial features were a little more exaggerated than the other people around him. And because they didn't think he was as smart as they were. When that attitude began to get in their heart, that is when they became guilty of this passage. If you can't look at another person, even if you don't like them, even if, even if they're not your favorite person to be around, and see them as a human being worthy of love and respect and courtesy and, and just even, even nothing else than that they're created in the image of God, if you have the capacity to speak terribly to them without any sense of, of, of guilt, then Jesus says you're worthy of the hell of fire. Now, even in that statement, there's a little bit of understanding we need to have because of that. The phrase here is referring to the Valley of Gehenna. Gehenna was basically a garbage dump. It's where you would take your trash and, and your, your, uh, your food remains or whatever you didn't want anymore. You took it and you threw it in the dump, and it was always on fire to burn it all up. So it was a smelly terrible, awful place where there's always fire going. And Jesus says, if that's the way you're going to treat people, that's where you belong. And so he's really trying to get them a gut check. The Pharisees, the people say, well, I've never killed anybody. Well, I've never done something terrible like that. But what's in your heart? What's in your heart? Are you living because of the standard of just because you've never done something terrible to that extreme, you think you're righteous? You think you're godly? Have you ever insulted someone out of anger or malice? Do you continually to hold a grudge against someone because of an offense without ever trying to seek reconciliation? The reason I bring that up is we'll get to that in just a moment. But do you ever look at someone and you could just as soon, um, you know, wish their, their demise rather than try and show them respect? Then you also are guilty. So what do we do with this? Jesus says that whenever there's animosity or anger, that you need to deal with that quickly. He continues in the passage and says in verse 23, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Think of the illustration here. What Jesus is saying is that they would have to take different gifts and offerings and sacrifices to the altar. Now, we still use those words, but they mean something different to us in our culture. If I said that you were to take a gift to the altar, what you would be 
probably most likely doing is bringing some money and placing it on the table we have down here in front of the sanctuary, the communion table. We have a totally different understanding. Even though we use the word altar, we don't give sacrifice in the same way that they did. They were giving a sacrifice or a gift to God as a, as a uh, reconciliation notion or an appeasement to God because of their sin. It was There were sin offerings, there were grain offerings, there were other things that you gave to God, part, sometimes out of joy to the Lord, sometimes as a, as a recompense to God. We don't do that anymore. The, the sacrifice was paid for us. So while we use the language, we no longer have an altar in front of us in church. So we have the communion table because the communion table represents Christ's body, his, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. So whenever we give a gift, it's not as an appeasement to God. It's not to try to produce reconciliation. It is we give it because we love God and we want to support the ministries that are going on. In this culture, when Jesus spoke this, they were still going to God and giving as a way of trying to have right fellowship with God. And he says, if you are going to the altar to make a, a, an offering or a gift to God, and you remember that your brother has something against you, lay the offering down, put the gift down, go find your brother and try to make amends. He says, it's more important to me that you go and you, you try to find peace with your fellow brother before you come and worship, before you come and offer this. You know, we're hoping to have worship service here at the church in some fashion by, by May 31st. We should take this to heart. Before we fellowship together, before we reassemble in this place, even if it's on a limited capacity, what if we took the opportunity now to call up somebody within our own congregation, someone we know has an offense against us, and we said, you know what, I realize I treated you poorly, or I, I know that, that you are, you're still upset with me. Let's see if we can work this out. What can we do to bring about peace so that when we gather together in this place, we can both bring our offerings of worship and praise to God? What if we began to actually practice this? You going to that person and trying to bring about peace. Later on in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus sort of flips the coin and says that uh, if you're, if, you know, this says if you know your brother has an offense against you. Matthew says if you have an offense against your brother, if you know that someone has grieved you, you're supposed to go to that individual. And one-on-one, -on -one, y'all address the topic and again, try to bring about resolution. Matthew 18 has additional steps. If that can't be reached, that's a, for a different sermon. But he still says that if you know there's discord, whether you're the one that did the wrong or you're the one that wrong was done to, you need to try to come together and find, find a restoration of that relationship. And then you go and worship together the Savior. Now, it's not always going to be possible. Different people are at different, different walks in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Some hurts are much, much deeper than others. And it's going to take time. and It's going to take a working of the Holy Spirit for some people. But you need to do what you can. You need to do all that you can do to live peaceably with the people around you, particularly your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, because you've both been forgiven of the greatest offenses and sins to God. And if He can forgive us, who do we think we are that we can't forgive each other? So he encourages us to, to make this, this relationship and seek this forgiveness and seek reconciliation. He goes on to continue and says in verse 25, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is giving us almost a small parable here. And let's, lay, let's set it up like this. Let's say I owe Jim um, uh, $1,000. He's given me $1,000 and I thanked him for it. And I took it and I said, I'll pay you back next month. Well, next month comes and I'm not giving Jim his $1,000 back. He says, you know what? I need that. I've got to have that money, and you haven't given it to me, so I'm going to take you to court so I can get my $1,000 back. The 
custom of the day was that I could go with Jim. I should walk with him and try to, as Jesus says, plead with him. Hey, Jim, couldn't we work something out? Let's, how about a payment plan? Listen, I've got $500 right now. I'll give it to you. Can you help? Can you let me pay it back? Listen, if I were able to scrape together $800, could you forgive a little bit and have the $800 right now? What's something we could work out? Could you give me just two more weeks? Anything. Anything that we could try and work it out peaceably between us. Because when you stand in front of the judge, the judge says, you know what, you owe $1,000, you're going to pay him $1,000, you don't have it, so he, hands a, he, he would hand me over to the jailer, and the jailer would throw me in jail. And I wouldn't get out until somebody had scraped together the $1,000 that I owe to Jim. And I think what Jesus is saying is that we, we've got to look not only about debts, but with all these other things. Let us try to quickly and, and as best we can come to peace with each other. Let's not have to make it a big deal or a, or a, or a bigger case than it needs to be. Let's try to find some common ground. Let's try to find some places of agreement. Let's try to find some attitudes of forgiveness and common courtesy so that we can go back to having great fellowship with each other and wonderful worship of God. So many of us, we want to hold on to other grudges. We want to, we want to be angry about things. We want to think about the way that we were treated wrongly and we were treated unfairly and we were treated unjustly. And, and that person deserves so much worse than my forgiveness. And we wish that the terrible feelings we had, the, the sleepless nights we've had, the, the stressful days we've had, we want them to experience it. Jesus says to us, you need to go to that individual and seek reconciliation as best as it is up to you. That's a different passage, but I think it's an important one. Because again, some people are going to take longer. I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'm just saying as a reality. If you're someone who loves to hold a grudge, you are in the wrong. You need to let that grudge go. And people will give you different teachings. They'll say that you're giving someone else uh, free rent in your mind or you're the one carrying the monkey around on your back or it's only, it's only affecting you. It, those, those are true, but there's a bigger issue here. The bigger issue is the fact that, that you are being more stubborn in your forgiveness than you have the right to be. If you're holding a grudge against someone, that's truly on you, not on that individual. And you need to find the place where you can remember the ways, the things that you've done wrong and the evils that you have done and the way that you have been forgiven and you need to offer that to that other individual. Even if they don't come and ask for it, you need to have the heart of forgiveness towards them. And God's Word says that as we do these things, we begin to have more of the life of what it means to be in the kingdom. You've heard it said, you should not murder. But I say unto you that if you have anger or you are insulting or you are, you are tearing someone down, that you are also guilty. I'm going to say this a lot over the next several weeks. You need to check your heart. Where's your heart? You've never murdered anybody. But have you ever insulted somebody to bring them down? Have you ever ridiculed someone because of the color of their skin? Have you ever wished somebody were dead because you just can't stand being around them? You are also guilty. And we need to all go to our Heavenly Father, confess these sins, and thank God that He forgives us as we should forgive others. Let's close together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I pray that we can look at the anger in our heart towards other people, and I pray that our lives can be marked by forgiveness. That we could begin to look at other people as created in the image of God and offer them the same grace and mercy that we have. May you work within the lives of the people who struggle with anger and struggle with hostility. Replace in them an attitude of of forgiveness and love. If there are people in our congregation, if there are families, parents and children, brothers and sisters, that there is a strife or a conflict 
between. God, I pray that you will let these words echo in their, hear, in their ears. It is time to seek peace. It's time to ask forgiveness. And it's time to forgive. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.